I've two poems I've written about the Scots Kelpie, K-E-L-P-I-E, which is a mischievous spirit, a very dangerous spirit associated with large still bodies of water, the locks, the lakes. And it can take many forms, but very commonly it takes the form of a horse. And the most common tale of it is of a traveler walking beside the lake, seeing a horse roaming loose, approaching and friendly, inviting the rider onto its back, and then dashing off straight into the heart of the lake and drowning them. And for all you could do, stuck on that horse, you're lodged to it, you're tied to it, you're trapped upon it, and no escape. And it may be that those bodies of water, the still lake reflecting sky, has a certain dangerous draw to us in certain moods. Certainly dangerous for playing and children and joyous at turning into adventures may turn into disaster but also the desire just to disappear within such a body of water as if you never were so perhaps talk of a spirit of a horse that will lead you straight in there is a warning there's so many ways in which it could bring us drag us down and drown us so this first one is just called Kelpie and it is of that hungry invisible lake that seeks to draw you in and drown you. The invisible lake presents a smooth face, heavy mercury lying in liquidity hides a huge and terrible hunger. I am as still as solid earth and yet subject to the wind and to everything that moves inside. I cannot stop, cannot fill, and I would have you clog me. I would have you saturated in a mutual taking in, held in your full lung. Such stirrings going on beneath, a world of fish and bite, jeering stones and reaching weed, rippling across like forced laughter. I am full only of women's call, show an understanding as solid as a man's. Sure, he can walk on me, mount the horse I offer for dissection of a moment. Fingers gripped by my lady hair, my iron reflection is as steady as the sky, as his will. She in turn longs to be river horse thinking I dissolve, seeks absolution, a gentler, steady ride for her. And though both at first desire to keep me out with clever skin and discreet lips, if I had enough of them, I'd stop them bobbing. Soon I permeate and find them liars, wetter than myself. Bags of fluidity, even with bones heavier than birds, floaters. A huge and terrible hunger raging, hidden by a staring eye, empty as a fall. The lake invisible commands a still face. Another creature out of folklore known widely in Ireland and a little bit in England, the puka, often takes the form 
of a goat or a goat-headed human, perhaps more mischievous than dangerous. Celebrated still in Ireland with a puck fair and remembered in Old England as the puck. This one is causing some mischief at a funeral feast. Puka. The puka slipped in at the funeral feast. No one saw. No one was sat at the seat it had taken. The seat left empty for the subject of the wake. And no one said a word of greeting or guard, but it was felt by all, I'm told. Blithely sitting once, now cold. And those who were big pushed rank, grew bigger still toward their share. And those who were small shrank smaller still, and being unheard, spoke only to the elves, and brought their knives to bear upon themselves. And no one said a word of greeting or guard. But it was felt by all, even the bold, sitting blithely once, now cold. Except, <clears throat> you're in my chair, Sir Goat. Will you give me room? Your time is dead and gone, Mr. Ghost. There is no room for you. Ah, <laughs> there is so too. That is my chair. This is my wake. But uh, <laughs> I will stand a while, sure, for politeness sake. Or ghost dropped of his chair. Speaking of ghosts, if it is a ghost. Ghost, in fact, it comes from the old English ghost of um, spirit or animating spirit or no, say like our ghost is inside us as we live and then death of the ghost goes somewhere else and the lich falls to the ground. Anyway, the fetch is a following spirit spoken of in English folklore and touched on in Scandinavian folklore. It's sometimes called the fulia, sometimes seen as a following spirit. Whether it's part of our own soul or whether it's another soul outside of us. I know it's often described as a older woman following an older woman caring for us and an older woman meeting us at our deaths. Whether that's the other as seen by men and that for women it's a different experience, I can't say, I can't tell. But something certainly these are true that the older man will out of habit still almost hanker after the younger, see what they're desiring as being of a younger, fresher face, when actually what their soul is more likely to be calling for is the wiser, more experienced and caring. And in this poem, you have the voice of the man, the older man, you have the voice of the older woman, the fetch. And then to finish the voice of the young girl and the young boy watching from the outside, fetched. The old man speaks. I have only these bare cupboards now, which lately held the last of autumn. Soon they will be yours to fill and offer to your love. I would have given you the cup of cider, the meats of the field and river, the late fruit, having not enough to last the winter, still a final bloom within a closing flare of a summer-like season, 
lick of gold upon my silver hair. <laughs> but who would listen to such an old store? Wolfing in your appetite, cautious in your place of rest, swiftness in your legs. Perhaps now when I have less, less to frighten, you will come by. You see me still, old man, as the spring blossom, first a bud of fruit, hope for the fresh kiss in juice, and a May day throwing off of clothes to see me blush. I have filled these shells for you these hundred years, your mother's too, this failing drip of hair and ice-coloured eyes, will you not see me? Still soft to the bone, still warmer than the world ever was, and stayed with you in the shadows and the storm. Put her away and have me. The fellow's gone. The house is haunted. He was handsome once. Cobwebs and rat's piss. He asked me to the dance, dirty old bugger. I fetched him an apple. And the last, returning to the Kelpie thinking of this beautiful horse, magnificent steed, that if you were to mount upon its back, or even pat your hand across its side until it sticks, and then be dragged into the deep waters. Kelpie. Its flank rippled like a wind kiss, silver on shadow. Its mane was like a leaping mind. Those hooves had never been still and they pointed behind. But I wanted to ride. I climbed on that moon back, felt it clamp to my inner thigh, thin hair between my fingers, felt the world slide. No more a walker of the earth, I was a ridden thing. Yanked through the sky, across a barren waste, hurtled high with the water churning fierce, fire in my eye, and all the choking, foaming, dragging my mouth wide, hurling across my gullet like a lake, found finally a sink point. I saw children, a dozen on a back, Rage of their mothers, arms thrown up against the air, water streaming from their eyes like hair, and the cautious one who would not mount but only pet, hacking at the fingers glued to the rent side of its, of its flesh, taken, all of them by another Kelpie bride. And the one child, at the end, without fear, singing from the bouncing fun, happy for the ride. I let my own tears run where they will, felt the strength beneath my thighs, the solid sweat and tumble of a wild thing running where it will. Then air was mine to catch, and hints of day, and moments under rocking, ease upon the bones, jarring turned to thunderstorms. I learned to turn my, hair, my horse's head a fraction either way, learned to keep its pace and my head aloft, watching, keeping from the race, learn to keep my bones from pounding into dust, the clawing from my face, learned to bring it even to a gentle stoop, pulling coal to grind behind its teeth, condensing rain to steam and sizzle on its side and me beneath. Much travelled now, the both. My mastery is such that I can 
stand again upon the earth though always my hand is woven in its mane and mindful touch <laughs>